going to begin today in verse 16, and we're going to do something surprising. We're going to cover seven whole verses, all right? Uh, seven whole verses in this fifth or sixth message in chapter 1. Beginning in verse 16, the Bible says, Now as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon and Andrew, his brother, I should say, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when they had gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his John, his brother, who were in their ship mending their nets. And straightway, and that's one of those words that uh, Mark likes to use. He uses immediately, straightway, and straightway he called them, and, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Today I'd like to share with you this subject, walking with Jesus. Walking with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your mercy and for your goodness and for your grace. We thank you for your love and for your watch care over us. And Lord, that you just meet every need and that your grace is sufficient for all of life. It's sufficient for this moment as we gather together here and we pray, Lord, for a fresh movement of your Holy Spirit in our life. We pray that you'll read not only, that you'll bless not only the reading but the hearing of this word and that as the church we would hear and have a spiritual ear to hear what you would say to your church today. As we investigate this day of walking with the Lord, what it must have been like to walk with your Son, I pray that you'll reveal to us by opening our heart and our mind's eye. And Lord, let our hearts burn within us as those two on the road to Emmaus experienced. As you reveal to us your truth, your realities, and your word. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Walking with, with Jesus. You know, in the last passage we learned, uh, as we had studied last week, we learned that Jesus has begun preaching and that he has returned to Galilee region. And when he does, he strikes out on what's going to be a three-year long earthly ministry. He's going on his itinerant ministry. He's going on his ministry tour. And as we follow him through the Gospels during this three to three and a half years, you and I can both agree that there's nothing like the world had ever seen when Jesus came and what he did. To follow him in that earthly ministry, not only was nothing like the world had ever seen, but, but really like the world will never see again in the way that Christ did it. Coming in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an humble man beginning to walk and to proclaim the kingdom of God and, and people finding out and revealing to them that he was the Messiah that would come. Israel's Messiah and the Christ or the Savior of the world. Would have been nothing like that every day in the life of Jesus in that public ministry would have been important. Now, 365 days a year, uh, which would mean that in three years, well over a thousand days, did Christ walk and teach? And, and uh, you know, what would it have been like to have just walk with Him on one or two of those days? We only have a selected few days. If you want to boil it down to it, we really only have a selected few days that are mentioned in all four of the Gospels combined uh, to, to know exactly what Jesus taught, to know exactly what Jesus did, you know, that's why the Scripture says in the book of John, in the end of that book, that the things that Christ taught and the things that He did, the world couldn't contain the volumes of books that could be written about that. But what is written for us is so that we might believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Really, what we have recorded for us is just a brief portion of this three-year-long ministry. 
But what I'd like to do today is I'd like to take this verse 16 down through verse 22 and just see what it might have been like spending a day or a couple of days with the Lord Jesus, walking with Him, listening to Him, and watching what He does. So let's start in verse 16 by, first of all, uh, listening to what Jesus, or actually seeing what Jesus saw. Seeing what Jesus saw. If you were walking with Him, you'd see some of the same things that He saw. But the issue is, do we see those things the way that Jesus saw them? Scripture said in verse 16, As He walked by the Sea of Galilee, He saw Simon and Andrew, His brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Verse 19 said, And when He had gone a little further, it means walking, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were mending or in the ship, mending their nets. So what we find as we walk with the Lord Jesus, in verse 16, he sees Simon and Andrew using their nets. And in verse 19, he sees James and John having used their nets, torn them some, he finds them mending their nets. And apparently, if you compromise, if you compare these, these Gospels together and compare them, it's apparently not the first time that Jesus had ever laid eyes on uh, Andrew and Simon. The first time he'd ever laid eyes on James and John. They had seen each other before. They had actually heard Jesus do some teaching before. And so this is not the first time that he comes walking by. And, but when they, they come walking by, the Scripture tells us, uh, uh, John giving us this missing information. Uh, Jesus comes by, He sees them again. And this time, He's going to call them to service. Now, these men are proof. When we think about Andrew, Simon, James, and John, these men are living proof for you and me that God looks on the heart of an individual. God looks on the potential of the individual and not just on the outward appearance. You know, you've seen this principle. I've seen this principle all down through the Word of God and maybe not even realize what's going on here. God looked at Moses and He said, You're going to be a deliverer for my people. And He said, Who in the world am I going to tell them sent me? And it was just one thing after another after another as God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush and finally they really got down to it. At the end, Moses basically said, Lord, just send somebody else. But it was Moses that God had chosen. Even though Moses said, I don't speak too well. God said, hey, am I not the one who made your mouth and made your tongue? I can make you speak well if I choose so. So here's Moses. And it was not the outward appearance that God looked on. It was the end. It was the heart. It was the potential. It was the same way as the angel of the Lord appeared unto Gideon and spoke to Gideon by saying, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. You know, Gideon wanted to look backward and see if somebody was behind him and he was talking to somebody else because Gideon was scared to death. The angel of the Lord did not come looking for somebody who was not scared. came looking for Gideon because God saw something in Gideon that outward eyes could not see. You could go on with Solomon. You could go on with David. You remember David? David was Jesse's little boy who was just a little shepherd boy. And after having passed up all of Jesse's sons, God instructs Samuel to anoint David as the future king of Israel. And it is there where we are actually told in those verses that God doesn't look on the appearance. He doesn't look on the outward appearance. But He looks on the heart of men. And even the Apostle Paul when Paul is making his confessions to churches as he's writing letters to them, he said, hey, I was not worthy to be an apostle. I wasn't worthy to be called as an apostle or disciple. I persecuted the church. I'm the least of the least. I'm the vilest of the vile. I'm the chiefest of sinners. And yet God chose him, the most unlikely, who was hell-bound and hell-deserving, yet God in His grace forgave the Apostle Paul and used him when others would have said, you remember when Ananias down in Damascus, he said, what well, I've heard about this guy. I've heard about him. He is a Christian hater. He is a church destroyer. And God said, you don't mind any of that. He's mine. You go down there, lay your hands on him, and pray for him, and then I'm going to reveal to him the thing he's going to suffer for me taking the gospel to the Gentiles. You know, it's amazing how God takes people who would be the most unseemingly useful people and He puts them to great use 
for the cause of the gospel of Christ. And here we have four men that are mentioned in verse 16, verse 19. And I want you to see what Jesus saw when He looked at these men. He saw some fishermen who would be faithful. You know, back in Jesus' day, fishing was tough. Not like today. It's not like today. Professional fishermen today, it's a little bit different. You know what I like in the fishing in Jesus' day when I'm going to have to when I'm going to have to compare it to modern day fishing, it was extreme. I mean, it was like, have y'all ever seen the deadliest catch where those guys go out on the Bering Sea and they're all over that place trying to catch them crabs? Listen, they're not catching them for me. I don't like them things no way. Amen? <laughs> yep. Now, it might be a little different if it was shrimp that's going after you. But it, they're going after the deadliest catch. I mean, the dangers that are out there in the ocean. Those men know. But what do we see today when we talk about professional fishermen? We see the Columbia breathable shirt. We see the fine Columbia cap with the expensive sunglasses. We see the thousand dollar rods and reels, and we see the bass boats. We see the Duramax uh, 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 trucks that are pulling those things and have their their uh, uh, vendors, their advertising, their backers with all their emblems supplied on them. We have cameras and we watch them, you know. Go out in these uh, boats, and these fast boats, and we watch them fish around with the latest gear stuff. Fishing was absolutely nothing like that in Jesus' day. Nothing like that. When he looks at these men, he sees fishermen that were tough. Listen, it took stamina. It took patience to be a commercial fisherman back in Jesus' day. You had to have the ability to stay steady in the face of adverse weather, difficult weather, tough weather, hard, threatening weather. You had to be able to handle equipment failure. You had to be able to handle long, difficult days and sometimes even longer, difficult nights. Sometimes fruitless nights. But these men that are men, when Christ calls them, He sees within them the potential of men to be faithful and to carry the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, no matter what. Now, all these men that I mentioned earlier, Moses, Gideon, David, Solomon, Paul, and all the other men that you think of in the Scripture who did a great exploits for the Lord, at some point in their life they had some failures. They had some up and down. So he never did look for perfect men, and neither were these four men perfect, especially old Peter. I mean, he just reminded me so much of me. He's just so imperfect, but the Lord uses him anyway because he sees fishermen who are going to be faithful. And the second thing is, he sees sailors who's going to wind, they're going to turn out to be soul winners. Now, I really don't love this word soul winner, but it's, uh, it's an S word, and it goes real good with this outline, and so I chose to use it, uh, I, because only, only the Lord and His Word knows that He that winneth souls is wise, but uh, I think it's hard to really brand a person as a soul winner, because only the Lord can save a soul. I think that, and really only the Holy Spirit can lead people to Jesus if you want to get technical. But what we can do is be witnesses to open the avenue for the Spirit of God to lead those people to Christ that they may be one. Now I think that's a more particular and technical uh, correct answer. But here we have sailors that Jesus said are going to wind up winning souls. And the reason is because they learn how to work in tandem. They learn how to work together. They learn how to cooperate together. And they would enjoy a successful fishing trip whenever they worked together. And these were courageous men sailing on what could be dangerous waters, having to depend upon and lean upon each other. And as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that the Lord can see how they're going to wind up working together, how they're going to face the enemies of the cross, and how they're going to hold the blood-stained banner high and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ unadulterated as they preach it, unmixed as they herald it. And those are the kinds of men that He's looking for, that once they are converted, that they will not be diverted into untruth or just give up. He sees these men who are going to love souls and going to want to win those souls for Christ if they can. And then lastly, concerning what he saw, he sees laborers who would wind up being leaders. You know what pool Jesus went to to get these men? He went to the common people pool, as one writer put it. He went and looked for common people. And that's where the Lord Jesus looks for personnel to lead His churches, I believe, even today. 
He came as a common person. He came among common people. He came and lived among common people. Loved the common people. Even ate among sinners and publicans. And, and He walked among us. And then He calls common people. He commissions them. He empowers them. And that's how He uses just plain people. He did not recognize any credentials that these four men may have had for worldwide ministry. He didn't even recognize or research their family pedigree to see if they were worth going out to share the gospel. He just saw what the human eye could not see in the plan of God, and He called those men to come and to follow Him. You know, I read over in 1 Corinthians, and, and I, won't, uh, I won't spend a long time here, but I'd like to, if you'd uh, give me just a moment, I'd like to read over in 1 Corinthians what the Scripture says about us. Paul wrote this to the Corinthian church because, you know, there are some of those people in that church that thought they were something. And they even, taught, they even thought that there were preachers and teachers that were something. I guess you'd say that. But here's how Paul, through the Holy Spirit, puts all this to rest. He said, for you see your calling, brethren. Do you see your calling? Do I see mine this way? The call to receive the gospel of Christ, to receive eternal life and the grace of God. For we see our calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Why? Why does God choose to do it this way? It's clear. 1 Corinthians one twenty nine says that no flesh should glory in His presence. But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus. It's not me that put me in Christ. It's Christ Himself that has seen to it that I am placed in Him. Amen. It's His to call. It's His to reach out. It's His to convict. It's His to draw. Not mine. Only to me is repentance and faith granted. Only to me in believing on the Lord Jesus Christ did salvation come to me. And that's the way it is even in this calling to ministry for these four men. He looked into the common people pool and God raises up men to true leadership by His own power. And why? So that not only men would not trust in them, but they preach the gospel of Christ, crucified, buried, and resurrected, so that men's hope would not be in them, but that men's hope would be in Christ and Christ alone. See, it's a big difference in what the Lord sees in people sometimes and what you and me see in people. If we were walking with Him, this is what we'd see, what Jesus saw that day. Now let's think about something else. In walking with the Lord, we'd get to hear what Jesus said. You know, it would have been something, I'm sure, uh, like no other thing, to have been able to sit and listen as the Lord starts in Matthew chapter 5 and starts talking about blessed is He. And listen to the entire sermon on the man. To hear Jesus' voice, to hear the inflection in His voice, where He raises His voice, where He lowers His voice, where He becomes emphatic in a point, and to follow Him along as He teaches through it, it would be something to hear what Jesus said. But I want you to hear today specifically in one little verse in verse 17, I want you to hear, and also in verse 20, what Jesus has said to these men. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Well, that doesn't seem like much. Just one little verse. But it, it, there's like a, a volume in here. And let me share with you just a little bit of what's in this verse. First of all, Jesus extends an invitation. In these verses, there's an extended invitation. What did He say? Look at that first little word. Come. 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 As He walks by and He 
Pharisees, one set of men working on their nets and one set of men casting their nets. He says to them, just alike, come. I think about all those verses. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Come to you, to me, you that hunger. Come to me, you that thirst. Simply here, he uses the word come in extending an invitation. And he calls these men to leave the family business and to come with him. Now we know that they've already met. We know that they've already encountered each other. But what the Lord Jesus is doing in this invitation is he is calling them into a life of service for him. Scripture says that they leave. Can you imagine you're working one day and you got your two sons working with you and you also got some employees, hired servants working with you and Jesus comes by and says, come. And they look at him at dad, old Zebedee, and says, dad, we're leaving. We're going to follow him. You know, we don't see anywhere. We don't read anything about the resistance of Zebedee. I think he's one of the greatest fathers in all the Word of God. Because he did not stand between those children going into a deeper walk with the Lord Jesus Christ when they were called to. And so he says, come. And these men, and I understand that not every person, not every man, not every woman is called to lead their worldly employment. But what we are called to do, each and every one of us in this room, what we are called to do is to adjust our priorities, to adjust our lives in order to put Him first. You know, to truly come to the Lord Jesus means to submit ourselves not just to the Lord in salvation, not just for the forgiveness of sin, not just a fire insurance, uh, a fire insurance policy from hell, but to come to Him and to follow Him truly means to submit ourselves in our everyday life to His will. And I want to ask you two questions that I have to ask myself these two questions. Number one, have I come to Him in salvation? That's, that's the initial introduction of Christ to our life after having hear, heard the gospel and being convicted that it is true, being convicted that that gospel has me in mind, being convicted that I am a sinner in need of a Savior, and that that gospel reveals to me that Christ is that Savior. That's the love of God poured out toward me. He's my only hope. He's my only help. He's my only means of forgiveness. He's my only escape from hell. He's my only entrance into heaven. I mean, listen, is there a time, a moment that I have come in desperation I've gotten between death and hell and only Christ can get me out and I have received and believed that He died for me and that He rose again that He's a living Lord today and confessed with my mouth and believed in my heart and I've truly been born again. Has that happened to me? Have I accepted? Have I received that invitation and acted on that invitation? And then secondly, have I begun to walk after the Lord? Have I begun, have I adjusted the priorities of my life as He calls me deeper and as He calls me deeper? Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, I want to confess to you as a pastor, as I look back, I understand that, that, that I preach on Sunday morning and that I preach on Sunday night and that I teach Wednesday night Bible study, but there has to be more. But that more is not going to come from me. That more is going to have to come from each and every one of us in this room. And as I look back and I think about the, the, the leadership in discipleship of the congregation and of believers within the church of Mount Hebron, I see where there is a great, great need to begin to develop some type of dis discipleship and accountability in our congregation. And with the Lord's help going forward, if He will get us in a situation where we can be more closely in contact more often, it is my full intention as your pastor to not just make sure that you are saved and that you go back and say, hey, I know where the Lord saved you. I know when the Lord saved you. I know what that preacher, I know what that baptism, I know it's not this church. I know it is because I have received the Lord Jesus Christ. It's something that only God did for me and God did in me. I, 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 I want that. I want you to know, to know that you have believed I want you to know who, not only you have believed in, but who you have believed. I want you to have no doubt about your salvation. And I think one of the best ways to do that is to start you on a road of discipleship that will confirm it in your everyday life. Here we have Jesus saying to those men, come. They prioritized His call in their life. And they
they began to follow after he extended that invitation. Then secondly, notice he offers inclusion. He says, come ye. See, I told you this, this is a, there's a volume here. You start taking it one word at a time, it's definitely a volume here. He looks specifically at them, just like I'm looking at Brother Derek. He's tough. He can take it. I'm going to point him out right here in the church. You're here, Brother Derek. There is not a Brother Derek in here. Praise the Lord. Amen? There's not another Derek in here. I'm talking to him specifically. Y'all are hearing me talk, but when I'm looking at him and I'm calling his name and this is meant for him, it's just him. He's on the hot seat. Because now he's got to choose whether or not to listen to me and he's got to choose whether or not to hear me and to be affected by what I'm telling him and to begin to follow me. Then offer that to y'all. Offer that to him. But then the next day comes, i got to pick me out another tough person over here. Brother Robert. Brother Robert's tough. Here's Brother Robert. The next day I call Brother Robert. Directly to Brother Robert. Now I'm not talking to Brother Derek. I'm talking to Brother Robert. See, I'm doing this to go overboard just a little bit. Because what I'm saying is this. There comes a time when he looks at you and says, Come ye. Ye. He offers inclusion. But it's a personal involvement that you have to decide. So there's a salvation and a becoming of a disciple. Those are particularly personal. Only I can answer for me. He's offering inclusion, yes, but only I can answer for me. I have to be, it's an individual call to join the same family, to join in the same vocation that every believer has joined in since the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody else can answer for me when it comes to salvation. And nobody else can answer for me when it comes to becoming a disciple, a committed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking to you today. Forget about that person behind you or beside you. Forget about that mom or that dad, that husband or that wife. Uh, forget about that child. Right now, I want you to think about you, what you did. Have you been saved? And if you have, have you heard that call? And I'm sure you have to walk a deeper, committed life with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he said to them. While it may have appeared he was calling them in pairs, both of them had the opportunity to say no should they have desired. But for them, that's a great because they didn't reject his call. So he's offering inclusion. And then he's offering personal. He's presenting to them personal involved. He says, you come what? After me. Now ladies and gentlemen, if you don't get anything else I say today, you need to get this. When Jesus said, come ye after me, this is real Christianity. This is real Christianity. This is not the social, occasional, benign participation in some church schedule or some church event. You know, I can take you today, and I know what I'm talking about because it's been first-hand experience. I can take you to those churches today that is, if it's an Easter pageant, if it's a fall festival, if it's a Christmas play, you can get folks to come. You can get folks invited. You can get folks excited. You can get folks uh, engaged and all that kind of stuff. You can even get some folks mad. You can even tear up the church. But I guarantee you none of it's over truly following Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, I, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that occasional visitor to the church. I'm not talking about that person that does things that actually wind up meaning nothing in the large scheme of things. I'm talking about true Christianity here. When he says, come after me, he's talking about taking up his cross, taking up your cross, and following after him. Personal identification on a daily basis in every area of our life. That's what it is. That's what true Christianity is. You hear people say all the time, it's not a, a religion, it's a relationship. Well, how's your relationship with this one that has caused you to walk close to Him? How is it really? He calls people to take up that cross and to learn of Him. To love Him and to live the doctrines and the commands that Jesus Christ has left to Him. Basically saying this, His life becomes our life. That's what Christianity 
is all about. His life becomes our life. And that's part of the Great Commission. Baptists are great at preaching the gospel and sending it to the whole world. Baptists are great. I mean, if we didn't know how to baptize, who would? We're Baptists. Right. We're great at those things. Preaching the gospel and then baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But you know what? As I look around and I hear this call coming from many pulpits, I hear it coming from many places today, we come shortest in the Great Commission when it comes to teaching them to observe what sort of things I have demanded. Why? Because that is presupposed to be true Christianity. Anybody can say I've been saved and anybody can be baptized, but only the life of Christ can live the life of Christ in a born-again child. He said, come ye after me. And then lastly, in what Jesus is saying, He introduces to these men a new innovation. This is something that has never been heard of. He said, you come after me and I will make you to become fishers of men. Fishing for men is something brand new. These men had never heard of such a thing, but they're now offered the opportunity to go and to fish for the souls of men. You know, my wife is here. She can attest that I actually said this to her. You know, sometimes this is not just a preacher's story, as I heard somebody say one time. Back February, maybe it was June, I'm not sure, uh, uh, January, February, somewhere back then, uh, we were maybe riding down the road or sitting at home, I don't know the occasion, but I made this remark. I said, you know, it has been years since I've done any fishing. And for some reason, I just kind of have a hankering. Now, folks from up north don't know what that word means. It's a want to. I'm not really sure what the origin of hankering is, but I had one. Okay? I had a hankering. And I said, I got a hankering to do a little fishing. Not, not, you know, the go big time, bit by me, a big old boat, all that kind of stuff. I just like, there's just some peace and some relaxation and fishing and enjoyment. I haven't done a lot of it since I was a kid. And I said, I think I'm going to go fishing. You know what I've done? None. I don't know if I can recall that I have wet one hook this year. Yeah, COVID had something to do with it. Those kind of things had something to do with it. But what I seriously intended to and desired to do, I just did not put as a priority to do, went on the back burner and didn't get done. You know, there may be those today that say, well, you know, I always meant to learn how to witness to people. I, I had a desire, had a had a hankering to learn how, but I just never did. And, uh, I just never have gotten myself in a position much to do that. But you know, here what you have being told you can become fishers of men, that, that's just, that just, just, it's just witnessing 101. It's sharing the gospel at its core. We're supposed to be His witnesses of all that He said. We're supposed to be His witnesses of all that He did to procure salvation for us. It's just telling other people what Jesus did to bring salvation to you and telling them it can be offered to them as well. You know, sometimes we see it as telling people what they need. And in reality, we do tell people what they need when we share with them the gospel. But they don't know that they need. Only the Lord has to reveal that need. But what we can do is tell them what the Lord Jesus did for us. And ask them if they will believe and receive that He's done that in and for and to them. And then they, it's, after that, listen, we sow the seed, we water the seed, but we do not possess the power to put the sunlight upon the seed for germination. We just can't do that. Illumination is up to the Lord. Amen. Conviction is up to the Lord. But the fact is, we're out there fishing. We're out there casting the hook. We're out there putting out the bait. We're fishing for men that they might be caught in the gospel net. Paul, excuse me, Peter and Andrew and James and John knew nothing of open-faced grills. They knew nothing of, uh, of uh, uh, zip codes. They didn't know anything about that stuff because they didn't fish like this in that day. They cast a net in that day. And for them, fishing for men is going out and casting the gospel, casting here, casting it there, and drawing it in. And sometimes you pull that net in, there's nothing.
stuff in there, sometimes you pull it in and it's full. I think that it probably was just a prophetic precursor when the Lord Jesus stood after His resurrection and told them to cast out and they cast out and they pulled in a drop that could not be brought in. I think that was just a prophetic precursor to what these men were going to do when it comes to spiritually speaking the souls of men and time to come as they threw out the net there would be a harvest, there would be a draw, there would be a drag that we could not imagine that would come in. And he said, you could be a part of it. Something new that they had never heard. It's part of the Great Commission teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. We are taught to go out and do the same. Their lives, when they trusted Christ, and the purpose of their lives are about to radically change. And folks, that's what ought to happen today. People's lives and the purpose of their lives should radically change when they receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Then let's move now. We're walking with Jesus. Remember, we have seen what Jesus has seen through His eyes. We have heard what Jesus has said. So now lastly, let's look at what Jesus shared. Verse 21 and 22. They went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. You know, Jesus shares some things as he goes into the synagogue. And it's very important for us because remember, not one day of his ministry was wasted, and not one thing he did is wasted on us. There's a sign. There's something for it. And there, there, there's truth in everything that it did. So notice some things here that's shared to us by Jesus. The first thing is the importance of God's house. He literally shares that with us by how He lived His life. You see, that He goes into the synagogue. The synagogue is not something you see in the Old Testament. It's just there when we open up the New Testament, right? It just, we don't really are told in the Scripture where it comes from, but you've got to remember that way back in the Old Testament, when they could not travel to the temple, some people, were, especially during the time of the captivity, people couldn't get to the temple, and there wasn't a temple that was functional to work at and to worship at. They had went to gather in different places and have worship, so they created what was called a synagogue. In other words, a time of, of, of worship all together on the Lord's Day when not everybody could get to the synagogue on the Sabbath. And so the, 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 or not everybody could get to the temple, I should say. So they made and created what is called the synagogue. So long story short, synagogue is just a local place of worship. But you always see Jesus in the synagogue and or the temple when the time of worship came. He is our pattern in all things. He's our example in all things. And what He's sharing to us in the habits of His life is the importance of the house of God. Hebrews 25, 10, 25 says that we're not to forsake the assembling of, of ourselves together as the matter of some is. And you know that's very difficult today to read that verse and to not think, well, you know, what about when you have a pandemic what happens when you have a deadly pandemic on the rampage and it's losing our nation? You know, I understand that there are some people who, who want to take some things and run to seed with them, and I have to be careful about that. But I do know this. I know that it's not intended for a generation to slip by without God's people making use of the house and the gathering of God together. Do I think that there's a problem with, uh, uh, with people missing for the time of COVID? I think that there is a reasonable cause for many people to not be in the house of God today. But I also know, ladies and gentlemen, COVID is not going to be the exception to meeting in the house of God forever. Right. It's going to come to an end one day. I'm not talking about COVID coming to an end. I'm talking about us staying out of the house of God because COVID is here. One day that's going to come to an end. It is. Because we can't just say, well, COVID has come now and that verse is now irrelevant. We can't say that. Well, I don't believe we have forsaken the assembling of ourselves together as the matter of some is and the way that it's spoken of in Hebrews. But there has been a pause 
for a cause in many people's lives. And I fully understand that. But there's coming a day that the pause button needs to be taken off. I can't decide when that's going to be for you. You are going to have to look at this verse and you are going to have to pray about this and you will have to be the one to make that decision. But I do know it is not intended for people to stay away from the house of God forever if COVID exists forever. Does that sound reasonable? Sure. But He is our example here that we should attend the house of God. How important is it to you? You know, there's some of the people, if they haven't turned me off already, okay, if they're watching me in, in video and haven't turned me off, got mad at me already. There's some of the people that are watching me that are part of Mount Hebron Church, and there are some people that are not even part of Mount Hebron Church, but they're listening right now. And, and, and they're not in church at this moment. Let me say to you, I understand that. Uh, you know, I understand that. And I th I'm sure that there is reason why there are those that if you could be, if your health or your position would allow you to be here, you'd pay a thousand dollars to get to start back at church. Your heart is with the Lord. Your heart is with the Lord's feet. You know, I think some of the most faithful church attenders in their life that have shown us beyond a shadow of a doubt the church and a meeting with God's people every week is one of the most important things that have ever been in their life. There are some of the people who are having to stay home right now and it's killing me. Amen. Because I hear it from some of them. It hurts them in their heart when Sunday comes around. And under the circumstances, they just cannot come I, I, I pray the Lord's blessing on those people. And that as soon as we can, as soon as we can, thank them for their example down through the years, and as soon as we can, be back in the house of God together. Well, you know, He shows the importance of God's house. Do you, as a parent, as a grandparent, as a friend, as a student, or you go to school, the family that you're in, are you an example of faithfulness to the house of God or carelessness toward the house of God? I think that's a good question for us to answer. So he shows us the importance of God's house. Then I want you to think secondly about the prominence of God's Word. He teaches us something here. He's sharing something with us. Remember what Jesus shared. Scripture said that when He went into the house of God, he taught. He taught. You know that's the premier activity of the church. Some people would think that it's singing. That that's the most important thing and that's the big thing that goes on in church. Some people would think that maybe it's a, uh, it's the social aspect of the church or, or it's one wing of the church. But you know, teaching and preaching of the Word of God, that is the premier activity in the life of the church. Now we're not told what He taught. I'm just about sure that you can go back uh, where last week we read verse 15 that he said the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. I'm, I'm almost certain that whatever he would have taught would have been in relationship to that. He would have gone in the Old Testament and reached out proof text to show who he is and why he was there. But he went into the Old Testament and he taught. But regardless of what he taught, it was true. And regardless of what he taught, it was needed. I know those things for sure. Now we need God's Word. And we need it for wisdom. We need it for knowledge. We need it for strength. We need it for stability. We need God's Word for instruction. We need God's Word for all those things. And I am persuaded, not just because my dad and my father-in-law were pastors, and not just because, because in God's uh, 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 choosing, I have become a pastor, but I believe the single most important segment of time in the week, not just on Sunday, but the most important segment of time in the week is when we gather for teaching and preaching at the house of God. The Word is the highest thing. You know how I know it's the highest thing? Because the Word of God tells us that there's only one thing God honors higher than His own name. And that is His Word. So it is the premier thing. And He shares with us the prominence of the Word of God. And then lastly, 
the magnificence of God's authority can be seen. Look at what it says in the last verse. And they were astonished at His doctrine. Next week, this bunch is going to be amazed. But today, they're astonished, okay? They're astonished at His doctrine. For He taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. See, when Jesus sits among them and He begins to teach, the effect is clear. I mean, it's clear that He brings a divine message doesn't bring the quotes of men. He doesn't bring the latest opinion uh, uh, of the, 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 the Levitical guru and share that with the people. What so-and-so yonder is teaching or what so-and-so yonder is saying. No. He brought them a direct word from heaven. And that's what I ask God to give us every time we are together. A direct word from heaven. And that's what He brought them. And God's Word is being spoken by God's Son. Can you just imagine being in the synagogue that day? Hearing the Son of God preach the Word and speak the Word. See, God's Word is not a newspaper. And it shouldn't be read like one. God's Word is not a magazine. And it shouldn't be shared like one. It's not some stock report. It's not a fictional volume. It's God speaking His oracles to us. That's God's Word. And Jesus goes into the synagogue and begins to teach. It's inspired. Just what He taught. Is this, everything that I'm telling you is exactly what we would say about what He taught. It is inspired. It is inerrant. It is infallible. It's true. It's not going to fail. It comes directly breathed from heaven. And it's able to make men wise to salvation. And it opens up to us the exceeding great and great uh, precious promises that Peter wrote in his volume that it does. The magnificence of God's authority in our life. Ladies and gentlemen, what I have here lying on this little pulpit and what I now am going to hold in my hand is the inspired and arrogant infallible Word of God. It is the most precious thing that has ever been placed into the hands of men. You know, we've held and seen some precious things, haven't we? We hold our children. We hold our grandchildren. Some of you in this room have been blessed enough to actually hold some great grandchildren. You know, when our children came along, we did what we had to. And then our grandkids come along, we try to play, and we can't do what we want to. And then when our great-grandchildren come along, I have no idea what I'll be able to do. I hope I still, I hope I just focus on them when they get in. We build some precious things in our hands, have we not? But not prepared for the Word of God. We've heard some precious things. I mean, we've heard symphonies and orchestras. We've heard uh, the sounds of nature. We've heard great orators speak thrilling things. We've heard a lot of things, but nothing like the Word of God. We've seen valuable things. We've recognized the value of certain things. You know, I think I shared with you that I was on the supervisory committee of the credit union where I do business, and that we were allowed to, to go into the vault one day and, and as part of our, our inspection, as part of our, 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 our duty there. The Fed had just delivered the money for the coming week. It was nearing the weekend. And the thousands and the thousands and the thousands and the thousands of dollars that were just stacked up on the pallets. You know, you just walk in there and think, wow. We've seen some valuable things, but nothing like what's written here in the Word of God. There are documents that assure men's rights, that assure men's Freedoms that assure men's posterity as much as ink and paper can assure. But there's never been a document written that can come close to what I have held in my hand. That's why when I look at you and I say to you along with the thousands of others before me that have said that the Word of God is the final authority for the faith and practice of the believer, you can believe. The magnificence of God's start. This is His work. This is His work. Not some convention's word. Not some religious business print word. This is God's word from heaven. Oh, as they heard 
Jesus speak. And they were all amazed. They were astounded. They were astounded. Does the Word of God still stir in you and move you? Convict you and convince you? I mean, listen. What does the Word of God do for you? He was our pattern. He went into the house of God. He taught the Word of God. And those people, as they listened to it, recognized magnificence of the authority. I hope it still holds the place in your heart that it should. Would you bow your heads, please?